Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us in Bible study. I hope that you are doing well. I hope your family is well. Uh, this day is uh, blessed by God. We're grateful that we've made it to this point in this day. Uh, we are uh, a blessed people because we have a shepherd who takes care of us and watches over us uh, all day today. The Lord has been caring for us all day today. The Lord has been providing for us. And what a privilege it is to be able to come together to study the word of God, to dig deeply into the word of God, that our lives may be transformed through the word. Uh, as I always say, I want to say again tonight, the beauty of this season is that you can practice evangelism. You can be a witness just with the click of a button. All you have to do is click uh, on your social media page, share. You can share it right now with all of your friends. Uh, we want you to share it and invite people to join us tonight in Bible study. You never know. Just by sending that invite, somebody may receive exactly what they need from the Lord through this Bible study. And so will you go ahead and share it right now? If you're watching us on YouTube, we want you to hit that subscribe button. Come on, hit that subscribe button. Uh, you will be up to date on all of the new content that is released on YouTube. You'll get notified. Just hit that subscribe button. Like us on all of our social media pages. God is doing great things here, and we want you to stay informed and be a part of it. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your compassion and your grace. Lord, we do love you, and we thank you because our love for you is because you first loved us. Thank you that we don't have to wonder about your love for us. We don't have to worry that your love for us will be canceled. Thank you that you love us unconditionally. And God, inspired by your grace and inspired by your love, we now open your word. And our prayer is that you will speak to us. And as you speak, Lord, I pray that our hearts and our lives will be transformed. Open up our eyes that we might behold glorious things in your law. And we'll be careful to give your name all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, we are continuing in this series, Save for What? God saves us from sin, from his very own wrath, and he saves us not only from, but he also saves us for. The Lord has brought us into the body of Christ for a purpose, to glorify his name practically by living as witnesses, faithful witnesses in the earth. And so it's so important that as a church, we're not just looking back at what God has brought us from, but we're also looking in the present at how we are expressing our redemption now in our lives. And we're also looking forward to the hope that God has called us to. And so tonight we're actually going to focus on extravagant generosity, extravagant generosity. I borrow this title uh, from a bishop, United Methodist Bishop by the name of Robert Schnace. He's the author of this classic work, a great book, very practical, The Five Practices of a Fruitful Congregation. The Five Practices of a Fruitful Congregation. And Robert Schnace says that one of the five practices of a fruitful congregation is extravagant generosity extravagant generosity. Many people have commented uh, on this book and on each of the five practices. And there is a blog called Stick With Jesus, written by a United Methodist minister. And I love what he says. He talks about extravagant generosity. He says, extravagant generosity is the love of Jesus in us, moving us, to give our lives, our time, our talent, and even our treasure to a mission. 
It's the love of Jesus in us, moving us to give our lives, our time, our talent, and even our treasure to a mission. It's a very succinct definition dealing with Christ being in us and the love of God filling us and motivating us to a life of generosity, to a life of giving, giving our time, giving our talent, and giving our treasure to a mission. And he goes on to say, focusing on this very cyclical pattern in many people's lives that is ultimately detrimental. He says, many people spend most of their life losing their health to try and gain wealth and then spend the end of their life losing their wealth, trying to gain their health. Have we bought into the fear and paranoia of scarcity that the world wants us to cling to? Or are we willing to engage in extravagant generosity? He says this very detrimental and cyclical pattern that when you're younger, you're working and working and working and you're so stressed out, you're losing your health trying to gain wealth. You're working not only 40 hours a week, maybe you're working 60 or 80 hours a week. You're putting in overtime upon overtime. You are losing your health trying to gain wealth the first part of your life. And unfortunately, if you were blessed to live this long, coming close to retirement, you retire. And then he says, you end up losing your wealth trying to gain your health because you got to go. Now that you've worked so hard, you've messed up your body, you've stressed yourself out. Now you have to pay medical bills upon medical bills upon medical bills in order to try to maintain your health. This is a very cyclical and foolish pattern. None of us will want that to be the description of our lives. And he says part of the reason for this is because of a paranoia that the world desires us to actually have a paranoia of scarcity, that we're never going to have enough. So we got to continue to cling and hold very tightly the things that we do have because we can't afford to give, because we are all at risk of not having enough. And I know some people say, well, if I just get that six-figure job, or if I just multiply these investments and I get this portfolio to a certain amount, I'm going to have enough. And the reality is, even when you get that, you'll still feel like you don't have enough. It's the paranoia of scarcity that the world wants us to cling to. And those who are clinging to this paranoia of scarcity are not willing to engage in extravagant generosity. It's what the Bible describes. The Bible, in, in the word, we receive uh, scripture that encourages us to do some self-examination and the question that we must ask ourselves is this. What profit are you pursuing? What profit are you pursuing? What are you trying to gain? Are you trying to gain the world, treasures, possession, materials, money, or are you trying to gain your soul, your true life, the true life that God wants you to have? What profit are you pursuing? And this is what Jesus asks. He wants you to, us to reflect upon in Mark chapter 8, verse 36. He says, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What does it profit a person to have all of the material possessions of the world and still have no peace? What does it profit a person 
to have a bank account full of money and still in misery. Well, what does it profit a person to have a portfolio filled with wonderful investments, interest and everything is going up, the earnings are going up, and yet you don't have the peace that is provided by the promises of God. What does it profit a person to gain the whole world and lose their soul? And so the question that we must ask is what profit are we pursuing? And here's what I believe. The generous life protects us from the greatest forfeiture ever. The generous life protects us from the greatest forfeiture ever, and the greatest forfeiture ever is losing your soul, losing eternity, losing life, trying to find or gain life. This is what Jesus says in, in Mark chapter 8, verse 35, which is the verse right before the one we just read, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. He's saying that in pursuing Jesus, in pursuing after the things of God, it might require releasing some of the things of the world. It, it requires uh, coming to a point where we are not so attached to the materials and the possessions of this world because we are pursuing after God. It's what Paul talks about when he says, these things I consider lost that I might gain Christ. I'm, I'm leaving some things behind, renouncing some things that I might gain the righteous one. So the generous life protects us from the greatest forfeiture ever. We see this, and I've shared this story sermonically before, about monkeys in the monkey trap. Monkeys are fast. They're agile. It, it's, it's near impossible to catch them. But those who desire to trap monkeys, they will design a trap, and they will design the trap to have a banana in a glass jar. The, the opening of the jar is slightly bigger than the monkey's hand. So as soon as they grab a hold of the banana with peanuts in them, the, those who are hunting them, those who are seeking to trap them, know that they have them. And the reason is because when the monkey is trying to pull his hand out of the jar, as long as he is holding the banana with peanuts in them, trying to pull his hand out, the opening is too small for him to pull his fist out of the jar, his clenched hand out of the jar. And in order for the monkey to get out of the trap, and get his hand out, he's got to release the banana with the peanuts. He's got to open up his hand and he can slide his hand out. But the monkey refuses to open his hand, continues to hold and grasp the banana and the peanut, which ultimately leads to his demise because the monkey is led to his death or capture simply because he won't release what's in his hand. The monkey's inability to release its grip on the banana is the reason the monkey is trapped. The reason potentially the life of the monkey is ultimately taken. And this, my brothers and sisters, is the same thing for us. We don't realize it, but sometimes our inability to release the materials of this world to live recognizing that we are not defined by what we have, that, that God wants us to release it so that we can be free. Our inability to do that is actually what is leading 
to all of the things that are actually taking our life. Acts chapter 2, 42, starting at, two, uh, at verse 42, it's describing, as we've read many times in this series, the early church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Verse 46, again, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Generous hearts. The word used for generous in this passage is aphilates, aphilates. And it literally means simplicity. Simplicity, aphilates. It literally means simplicity. Some translations, the English Standard Version, the New Revised Standard Version, translate this word that means simplicity, generous. If you read it in other versions, it simply says simplicity or singleness of heart. Simplicity or singleness of heart. So in the ESV, you have generous. In the New Revised Standard Version, you have generous. In other versions, you have simplicity or singleness of heart. Through this verse, we receive a description of the heart that is able to live in the generosity described in the early church as they're selling their possessions and distributing the proceeds as any have need. What, what kind of heart enables them to live in such extravagant generosity? And I believe it is a heart of simplicity or singularity of focus, singleness of heart. This means that the simple life or the life that is singularly focused on God, the heart that is singularly focused on God, enables us to live in the extravagant generosity that God desires. You do recognize that if you are focused on so many different things, if your heart is pulled in so many different directions, if your cares and your affections are for the things of the earth and the world more than they are for God, you cannot live in the generosity that God desires. We must recognize that even in the parable of the sower, Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, it says that the thorns represent the cares of the world. And this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of what? Riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. The deceitfulness of riches that's connected to what we talked about, how you can lose your life trying to find your life. The deceitfulness of riches says that if you have this, you're going to be happy. You're going to have joy. You're going to have peace. You're going to have life. That's how riches can deceive us because we possess those riches and discover that the promises of the things that we thought we were going to find there can't be found. And so the cares of the world hinder us from living in the extravagant generosity that God desires us to live in, which is why Jesus says you can't serve two masters. You, you, you can't serve God and money. You can't chase after God and money at the same time. That, that we have to have a singular focus. Jesus says those who are consumed with the cares of of this world, who are chasing after the things of the world, who are hoarding the things of the world, Jesus says, this is foolish living. This is foolish living. 
And you've probably heard this parable or you've heard it mentioned, uh, the parable of the rich fool. This is Luke chapter 12, starting at the 15th verse. And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Jesus says it is foolish to store up all of the treasures of the earth and not be generous towards the things of God. And the reason is because none of it can come with you. When the Lord calls your name, as he says in this parable, tonight your soul is required of you. All of the large barns that he built, overflowing with crops, mean nothing. What means something is the treasure, the treasure that he will bring before the presence of the Lord because he has sown into kingdom work. But this rich fool did not do that because he was so consumed with the cares of the world. And so this is not the singular focus, the, the simple heart or the simple life. Conversely, what is the simple life? Matthew six thirty three. Matthew 6, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Here's what I like about it. It's talking about shelter and clothes and food and all of the necessities of life. He says, don't, don't seek after all of those things. Have a singular focus on seeking and pursuing after God. And as you focus on God, as you put your attention all on God, he says everything else is just an added benefit. He says it will be added unto you. God knows you need it. It's not saying that the materials of this earth in and of themselves are evil, but they can take our hearts away from the things of God. And so if our hearts are set on God, God says, I'll take care of everything else. But let your focus be on God so that way you can live in the generosity. Those who focus on God, they live in the extravagant generosity because they know that the possessions that they have don't define them. So if they have them, great. If they release them, great. They are still the same. And so this singular focus, this singular life, those who have simple lives, singularly focused, are able to live in the extravagant generosity that God wants us to live in. And so this extravagant generosity is giving generously for kingdom mission and kingdom purposes. Kingdom mission and kingdom purposes. So Paul, one of the major missives that he has, one of the major objectives that he has is to raise money for the Jerusalem church. And he goes throughout his Gentile churches, predominantly Gentile churches throughout Gentile regions, and he's collecting an offering that will be carried to support the Jews or the Jewish church. They're not as prosperous as some of his other churches. And so here is a collection that he's raising. This is one of the major initiatives of Paul 
in his ministry. And he describes the church of Macedonia who was committed to making this contribution, who was committed to giving generously for this kingdom purpose. And we find this example in 2 Corinthians 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. First two, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. When you read that slowly, it should jar you and grab you because it seems oxymoronic. In their great affliction and in their great poverty, it has overflowed into extreme generosity, a wealth of generosity on their part. That does not make sense. But that is what grace will do. People who may not have as much sometimes end up giving more, not because they have more material possessions in the earth, but because their heart is compelled to take what they have and offer it towards kingdom mission and purpose and ministry. Here it is, for they gave, this is verse three, they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. Nobody had to prod them. Nobody had to beg. Nobody had to write to them and say, we really need you. No, they went above and beyond of their own own accord. And not only that, verse four says, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. They wanted to take part, earnestly begging to take part in it. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Here it is. They gave themselves first to the Lord. Those who participate and engage in extravagant generosity, I know that they have yielded and surrendered themselves first to God. You cannot live in extravagant generosity and not be yielded, surrendered to God at the same time because you are the first offering. Laying yourself before God yielding before the Lord, coming before his presence and recognizing that everything that you are, God has made you. Sacrificing whatever needs to be sacrificed. Lord, I lay myself at the altar that you might be glorified through me as I generously contribute. They gave themselves first to the Lord. Meaning that the generosity of our lives could be an indicative or an indicator of the level of our surrender before God. This church, the church of Macedonia, in their extreme poverty, it overflows into a wealth of generosity on their part. I've seen individuals who you look and, and they may not be considered wealthy in the world, people wouldn't look at them and they wouldn't make Forbes magazine and uh, the wealthiest people. They wouldn't even be close. As a matter of fact, not even amongst the richest, amongst middle class. They, they wouldn't even be close. But they live with such generosity. And they give. And you're saying, how is it that this person who really doesn't have much can give so much. And this person who has a lot gives so little. It's because their lives have been yielded and surrendered to the Lord and they are now more willing to release and give because they have given themselves first to God. And so we should seek to excel in extravagant generosity. This is the same 
chapter dealing with the same people. Second Corinthians eight, seven. Here it is. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Seek to excel in extravagant generosity as you excel in everything else, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in all earnestness. That there should be an earnest desire on our part, every believer, every child of God, to excel in generosity. Giving up your time, your talents, and your treasure. Excel in it. I want to excel in it. I want to do better. I want to continue to grow in my generosity. And the reason is because, according to verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is. We are saved because of the extravagant generosity that God has given to us. That though he was rich, yet for our sake, he became poor. He renounced the riches, the celestial glory and riches of heaven became poor. That we might become rich. Imagine if Jesus clung to the celestial riches of heaven and was unwilling to release. We would not be saved. We would be stuck in our sins, unable to deal with the wrath of God. But because Jesus released, came down, wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger, not born in a palace, didn't even grow up in the the holy city, but grew up in Nazareth. Carpenter's son. Family couldn't even afford the regular sacrifice in the temple. Came and became poor that we might become rich. And this is why we ought to seek to excel in the generosity that God has for us. We should seek to excel in extravagant generosity This is another major and primary reason why we should seek to excel in extravagant generosity, because extravagant generosity, generosity is a sanctifying work for us. It's a sanctifying work. We are made more like Jesus through our generosity. The generous Lord who came and became poor, that we might become rich. We are made more like him. We are conformed more to his image as we live in the generosity that he demonstrated. Perhaps this is why, second only to the kingdom of God in scripture, Jesus talks about our riches, how we use our treasure. He talks about money and how we live and how generous we are. Second only to the kingdom of God, which says that our money and how we steward it, how we give, how we sow is reflective of God's work in our lives, the sanctifying work in our lives, our maturity level in the Lord our growth in the Lord, because if you are truly growing in your understanding of God's grace in your life, it is reflected in your generosity. It's reflected in your willingness to sacrifice. And so for kingdom purposes, this is what Robert Schnee says in the five practices of fruitful congregation related to extravagant generosity. He says, generosity is the fruit of maturation in Christ. And it is the result of God's sanctifying grace that molds our hearts and changes our values and behaviors. Generosity is the fruit of maturation in Christ, the result of God's sanctifying grace that molds our hearts 
and changes our values and behaviors. That as we mature in God, we become more generous. And it is the result of God's sanctifying work in us, making us more like Christ and molding our hearts and changing our values and behaviors, changing our values that that we prioritize the things of God and kingdom work more than anything else. I think one company that demonstrates this dealing with values and kingdom work and honoring God through the Sabbath. Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A. You ever tried to go there on a Sunday? (laughs) Closed. Can't go and get that great chicken sandwich on Sunday. All the Chick-fil-A's are closed. Honoring the Sabbath. While every other fast food place, McDonald's, open, Cookout open, all these different places open, Smithfield open, Sunday open. But Chick-fil-A says, we're, we're, we're closed. But you know one thing I noticed? When I look, and there's a McDonald's not too far from my house, a McDonald's right across the street from a Chick-fil-A, and I look at the lines, Chick-fil-A's line is always around the corner, Monday through Saturday. And God blesses Chick-fil-A because of their commitment to put God first. Isn't that that amazing that God can do more for you as you honor him in six days than some do in seven? That's that's the, the value system. What is it that you value and how are your values reflected in your stewardship of your finances? Uh, Pastors say, and I've heard sage Uh, Christians say that if you really want to know what someone values, you need to look at their checkbook or their bank account. And that will tell you every time exactly where people are putting their priorities. Your bank account, your checkbook, which is what Jesus knew, which is why he talks about the treasures in our lives. Now, I know the big question, closing tithing versus grace giving. The tithe, the tenth, 10 percent versus grace giving. We're under grace. Do we have to tithe? Grace, uh, the tithe was under the law. Now we're not under the law. We're under grace. Should we continue to tithe? I think it's important that as we look at the 10 percent, I see the 10 percent as a biblical principle, a biblical principle of stewardship. And I say this because the tithe is actually mentioned before the law. This is Genesis chapter 14, verse 20. Genesis chapter 14. Talking about how Abraham. Blesses. Melchizedek. Verse 20, the B part says, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. A tenth. There, Abraham blessing Melchizedek, the tenth is mentioned. Jacob mentions the tenth to God. God, if you bring me back safely, I'll give you a tenth. It's mentioned in Genesis even before the law is ever mentioned. I see this as a biblical principle of financial stewardship. Dealing with Malachi, you know, bring the tithe into the storehouse. That there may be meat in my house, that the work of ministry might be done. And so the tithe is a biblical principle of financial stewardship that I see all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout Scripture. And then you come to the New Testament and you have grace giving. And what is grace giving? That's, that's, that is giving that is motivated by the example of Jesus Christ that is compelled by the spirit of God that is inside of us. And here's my conviction based upon Scripture 
that grace giving actually goes beyond the tithe. That grace giving goes beyond the 10 percent. Grace giving goes beyond the law. For those who believe that tithing is under the law, grace giving is going to far exceed that. So I look at the 10 percent as a biblical principle, a starting point, but certainly not a stopping point. Mark chapter 10, verse 21, dealing with grace giving, the rich young ruler says, and Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, go and sell, here's the key, all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Go and sell all that you have. And then the rich young, your rich young ruler walks away. He has a very difficult time heeding that counsel and that exhortation from Christ. He just has too much. He's too attached to his possession. So what does he do? He forfeits relationship with Jesus, eternal life for the treasures of this world. Mark chapter 12, verse 44, dealing with this widow's offering. The people are coming into the temple and they're dropping all of their large amounts of money and they're doing it to be seen. Coming, making a lot of noise, pump, circumstance, everything, just dropping money because they want everybody to know how much they've given. And Jesus is sitting watching what they're giving. And he sees this widow who comes with the mite. It's less than a penny. She comes and contributes it to the offering box. And this is what Jesus said. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had. All 100 percent that she had to live on. Grace giving. All everything. God, you are worthy of it all. So how dare I grudgingly hold on to what you blessed me with in the first place? It all comes from you. It all belongs to you. Grace giving says everything belongs to you. The earth is yours, the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. And so, God, because you sacrificed it all for me, I'm willing to lay it all down for you. Grace giving is the bar that lets us know that matter, no matter how generous we may be, no matter how extravagant we may be in our generation, ge generosity, we haven't given everything. So there's always room for growth. The tithe is the starting point. Grace giving is the standard. And all of us are somewhere in between. Or should be somewhere in between. Some of us are below. But should be somewhere in between, which means that there's always room for us to grow in our generosity as an expression of our love for God. So what does this mean practically for us as believers who are saved by the generosity of God? It means we should pray about our generosity we should pray about our giving. We should really pray and go before God and confess. Confess covetousness. Confess when we cling to the possessions of this world and we believe that our lives are found in them. Confess it. Confess it. Confess it. Confess it. When you feel that your heart has been compromised by the love of of the things of the world and the treasures and trinkets of this world. Confess it and say, God, I want to love you more. And I want my love for you to be reflected in my generosity towards you. God, I want to submit and sow to kingdom work. So, Lord, I surrender to you first because I know that if you have me, you also have what's in my hands. Pray about your giving. Plan your giving. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so, 
prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. Don't let your giving just be random and arbitrary and last minute. No, extravagant generosity requires planning and preparation and discipline and budgeting. It requires planning and setting aside. Don't go on Amazon and buy up everything that you see on Amazon. Get it in two days. And when it comes, you've spent all your money. And by the time it's time to give God something, you're looking and every your house is filled with all these Amazon boxes that that money. Some of the money should have gone to the Lord, if not all. Plan it. Plan your giving. And, and there's a financial stewardship aspect of this as well. Because we have not been saved from the debt of sin to be indebted up to our necks and can't do anything else. Because we have not demonstrated the virtue of patience. We have quickly amassed all kinds of credit card debt, high interest rates have more liabilities than we do assets. We can't, we cannot expect to live in the extravagant generosity that God wants us to live in if we are also not being good stewards holistically over the resources that God has blessed us with. And so the desire is to make sure and ensure that we are living fiscally responsible. It's a part of planning. And then maybe you are giving, giving the 10 percent or you're giving above, you're giving 15 percent, 20 percent. Leave a legacy. Leave a legacy. Robert Snape tells a story in, in Five Practices of a Fruitful Congregation. He says there was a baptism and a grandfather was holding a baby. And he made the remark, That's, this is not my baby. Gave him the wrong baby. This is not my baby. This is not my grandchild. And the next day he showed up at the pastor's office and said he's changing his will. And he wants some of his will to go towards the church. And the pastor said, what? What in the world? Why? Why? How are you? What motivated you to do this? We're great. We're glad, glad about it. But yesterday we were in here. Today you're coming in and saying I'm giving some of my will to the church because I want to leave a legacy. And he said, because I was convicted. Because. As I was holding that baby, I was saying, that's not my baby. And the Lord corrected me and said, all of the children in the church are in the family. And so it's not just your grandchildren, but it's also the other children in the church that you want to bless and support. He said, and I'm leaving a legacy for my kids. They're getting some of my inheritance, but I also want to leave a legacy for the work of ministry and the people in the church. That's extravagant generosity. That's what God wants us to do. That's what God has done for us, and that's why we're saved. I pray that our hearts will be open and compelled to live in the generosity of God. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks and we give you praise for your generosity towards us. Pray that our hearts will be opened. That God, our hearts will be generous because we are singularly focused on you. We are pursuing after your glory, pursuing after your will, and not finding our lives in anything or anyone else because we know that our lives are found in Jesus. Thank you for this great privilege to live in the freedom that you have provided Thank you for the privilege and the grace that you have shown towards us. And in gratitude, in joy, we give generously to the work of ministry and mission. We know that you have saved us for this purpose. One of the reasons why you have saved us is that we might live extravagantly generous. So we love you, God, and we honor you. We worship you for this great privilege that we have. In Jesus' name, we pray that all the people of God say, 
Amen. Again, we encourage you to share this. The good thing is this is a recording. If you're watching on Facebook, uh, you can share it with someone else. It will be stored and saved. Share it uh, to encourage someone in their faith. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Can't wait to see you in the sanctuary, embodied very soon. We thank God for this virtual worship experience and virtual Bible study. I pray that your families are blessed. God bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless you.